Good evening and welcome to Money Matters. My name is Kim Hatsa and I'm a business attorney in Radnor, Pennsylvania. I focus my practice in the areas of life sciences, healthcare, and information technology. Tonight we're continuing our special series on life sciences leaders in the Delaware Valley. Um, before we get into the show, I do want to remind our viewers that from time to time financial issues relating to life sciences, healthcare, or technology matters or companies may be discussed on the show. These discussions are not and should not be viewed as financial advice. Moreover, since this program is pre-recorded and shown at a later date, please keep in mind that the information may no longer be current. You should always check with your financial advisor before entering into any financial transaction. Um, I'm uh, happy to have with me again uh, this evening Charlie Huntington. Charlie is a co-founder and board member of BioStrategy Partners, a tax-exempt organization that helps life sciences entrepreneurs build and grow their pre-seed companies. Charlie, thanks for being here. Thanks. Charlie, we have an interesting show tonight, a guest from a, uh, from a field uh, that we have not yet had on, on the show. Uh, we have a lot of information to cover, so I'm thinking rather than you and I kick around a, a hot topic in life sciences that we might better be suited getting right into the show. That sounds like a great idea. Okay, so why don't I do that? Uh, I want to remind our viewers that if you have a question for us uh, that you would like us to answer on a future show, please feel free to send that question to Money Matters TV, 205 East Levering Mill Road in Ballakinwood, Pennsylvania, or alternatively email that question to Money Matters TV at gmail.com. It's now with great pleasure that I introduce our special guest this evening, Frank Miranda. Frank is the president and CEO of EAC Valuations, a company that has provided in-depth and trusted business appraisals for more than 40 years for both publicly traded and privately held companies across a variety of industries, including the pharmaceutical industry. Um, Frank is a chemical engineer by training with more than 25 years of experience in management and engineering with multinational chemical companies, including Engelhard, which is now BASF, and the PQ Corporation, among others. Frank is a certified machinery and equipment appraiser and holds numerous other certifications in the appraisal and valuation fields, including the following. Uh, he's an associate member of the American Society of Appraisers in Mechanical and Technical Specialties. He's a certified valuation analyst, as determined by the National Association of Certified Valuation Analysts. And he's a business certified appraiser in business valuations, as determined by the International Society of Business Analysts, where he's also a member of the Education Committee. Frank has a, both a BS and MS degree in chemical engineering from Rutgers College of Engineering in Piscataway, New Jersey, and he also has his MBA from Rutgers Graduate School of Management in Newark, New Jersey, with an emphasis on finance and accounting. Frank, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Uh, Frank, I always find it interesting when we have a guest <coughs> who seems to have made a, at least at first blush, a, a mid-career uh, transition. Particularly people who have gone to school uh, for a profession or something that takes a lot of time and, uh, and uh, you know, sweat equity, I guess. Uh, and so you were an engineer, and now you're in the business valuation field. Is that a dramatic transition, and can you talk to our our viewers a little bit about your transition. Sure, sure. It's uh, it, it, it is quite different in terms of the types of things that we do, and and, and certainly the training that I had when I was uh, 19 or 20 years old is very different than what I'm doing today. However, you know, I I started as an engineer with the Dupont Company, as all good chemical engineers are supposed to do, um, but quickly moved out of the engineering realm in, in terms of designing and. Uh, new equipment or improving process equipment into the business side fairly quickly in my career, uh, starting with sales, then business development, business management. Uh, moved through a number of uh, multinational companies, as you had uh, as you had mentioned, you know, to a point where in my career uh, I was almost in a revolving door kind of situation, where uh, the chemical industry, which cycles every three years, I was the first guy out. So I was spending too much time looking for a new job as opposed to doing a job. So uh, about 10 years ago, I decided enough is enough and went out on my own. And one of the things that I liked about my career at the chemical process industries 
was M&A. So I was involved as a business manager, as a technical manager. I was involved in divestitures and acquisitions of the companies I was working for. So I wanted to pursue that. So I began a career helping other business owners either sell their business or buy an additional business. And uh, just so happened, friends of a friend of a friend, kind of a meeting, chance meeting, I met with the owner, founder and owner of EAC Valuations at a shore house um, among friends. Uh, he asked me to help him sell his business. He was into his 70s and was looking to retire. And I said yes. Um, as we went through that process, which took about a year, I noticed that a very large part of their business was with heavy industry Fortune 100 companies. A lot of chemicals, pharma, energy, oil refining, and so on. It's right in your wheelhouse. Right in my <laughs> wheelhouse. And I said, um, I can do this. Yeah, and perhaps, you know, uh, you know, um, doing a, you know, creating a cardinal sin of, you know, of being a business broker, buying something you're trying to sell. Uh, I did it anyway. So in 2007, almost exactly seven years ago, a little over seven years ago, we uh, I purchased the company, and we've we've gone from there. Wow. Um, would you say that? How would you say that your the early part of your career helped you transition to the to the like the skills the skills that you developed, and was was the transition, um, I guess, made easier because of the types of clients that this particular business had, the clients that you just identified, or was it more than that? Was it, were there other skills too? Well, there was just uh, generally speaking as a business manager over so many years, uh, in all different kinds of businesses, uh, some were multinational businesses, some were local businesses, uh, it, it created a very diverse experience background for me, and which is something that we run across all the time. Uh, whether it's in a heavy industry setting such as uh, a DuPont company or, or a small startup or a small service company in the, uh, in the local area. Um, I'm able to call on those experiences, those business decisions that I made and apply them to the appraisal. And to me that's much more valuable than, uh, than any classroom work that you may have gone and, and, you, and you go directly to uh, become a evaluator because you just received your MBA from wherever. Uh, I've lived the experiences. I know what the client is going through, and that helps me help the client. What would you say, um, uh, what aspect of your current duties uh, would, you, would you say has been the most challenging for you? <clears throat> well, um, one of the things uh, it, from the technology point of view as to what we do, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's math, it's creating models, and and predicting uh, cash flows and, and things like this and understanding equipment, that kind of thing. That's pretty much what I've done and, and that's really not that difficult. You know, coming in for, as an engineer, the training is, is, is very transferable. What's different is the rules. And as you know, the, there's lots of rules. Uh, re and rules that are promulgated by the IRS, the SEC, um, SBA, uh, federal ba other federal banking uh, authorities, and some of them are contradictory. Um, and in an engineer's mind, that's that's a problem. <laughs> uh, and to the point where, and I describe this to people that you know, really separating the left side and the right side of your brains, where you got to put tax on one side and book or SEC on the other side, because they're very different rules and. And many of our clients don't have that distinction, and they, they start asking questions about, well, why did you do this? I should be able to amortize my depreciation or my, my goodwill over 15 years or, or, or book it this way because I, could, I do that on my tax statement. Well, forget about your tax statement. It doesn't apply if you're reporting in the gap. Um, and so that took a while to, uh, to work out, but I'm getting a little better at that. Um, the second uh, area is that it's a, it's a very different kind of business, especially in the appraisal business. Uh, working for large companies, we had multi-year contracts and you know every week we'd send a rail car of material or whatever drums of, of product out to the customer and every three years we'd renegotiate a contract and increase the price by four or five percent and 
hopefully to volume by four or five percent. That doesn't happen in the appraisal business. It's a um, it's every day is a new day, a little bit like uh, Groundhog Day. You know, mm -hmm. you you start all over again every single day. Uh, we've got very limited amount of business. That's what we would call an annuity business, where every year we get to do the same type of job, update the same type of report. But well over ninety percent of what we do comes to us as as an event. It's it's event driven. Something happens. Somebody buys something. Somebody sells something. Some uh, they have an insurable loss. Uh, someone died. Someone wants an estate plan. Whatever it happens to be. We've never seen the people before, and our chances of seeing them again are, are remote after we've finished the project. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about EAC Valuations? Sure. Um, EAC Valuations was founded in 1971 uh, as primarily a real estate and a machinery and equipment appraisal company. Uh, the original founders of the company were all real estate appraisers, and one had extended into machinery and equipment. And really, for the first 30 years of its existence, that's pretty much all they did. Now, they did uh, equipment appraisals and real estate appraisals for property tax reasons, for acquisitions, and so on, for some very, very big companies, um, including a very good representation of the Fortune 100. So there's a, a lot, of, lot of big name experience there. Um, However, um, after about 30 years, the company, well, the company had grown quite a bit and actually was up to about 50 people uh, in, in around 2000, just before 9-11. And within a, a, you know, right after Sarbanes-Oxley, when the large accounting firms, the big A, could no longer do all of the valuation work or other, um, uh, you know, uh, ancillary work for their clients any longer, the company moved into business valuation and intangible asset valuation. So that started with uh, with FAS 141, which is an accounting standard on um, setting up an initial balance sheet. When uh, the SEC requires when a company buys another company or there's a change in control, a new balance sheet has to be created. And that's what we did. Uh, previously, there were other methods of doing that, but also our company was limited to only the tangible assets, where many times, especially in pharmaceuticals, a very large part of the purchase price is intangibles. It's patents, it's technical know-how, it's R&D, and, and things like that. So beginning around 2000, the company moved into uh, that those particular areas, hired some people. And uh, unfortunately, after 9-11, uh, things, of course, took a uh, took a downturn, and by that time, the owner was in, well into his 70s and slowing down physically. So, so things sort of decayed a bit, you know, through the 2000s, and and then I came in in 2006 to try to sell it, and then in 2007, I I bought so it. You're gonna do it. Yeah. Is there a particular type of valuation or appraisal that you view as your your bread and butter? Primarily because of our background. Um, you know, today EAC we, uh, EAC valuations. We have three engineers on staff, including myself, another chemical engineer, and a material science engineer. We have a PhD chemist on staff, who is a biochemist actually, uh, involved in drug development. So, appraisals that relate to the pharma industry in terms of um, new technology, uh, we ha we can be very good at. We can ask the right questions. Um, we understand what the processes are for approval, drug approval, um, and related industries to that. We, we've got an inside track, I think. We know how to ask the questions. Similarly, for the manufacturing, we're engineers. You know, we can go into a heavy manufacturing plant. It could be an oil refinery. It could be a steel plant. Or it could be a, a pill plant. You know, we understand what's going on there. And with that, we can provide a much better appraisal report because we, we, we can ask the right questions. We can get deeper into it. Um, we can challenge the business owner or the, the management team uh, about some of their assumptions and make sure that we all understand. And, and hopefully it, 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 uh, it addresses questions that maybe you know, a third party who's looking at this valuation mm -hmm. you know, won't have to ask. And whether that third party is another investor or the IRS or, or who knows you know, who that would be, you know, we're gonna we're gonna ask those questions before and answer them, mm -hmm. 
uh, before it gets to a third to party. Point. Yeah. Are there? I, I mentioned earlier that that you do appraisals and valuations across a lot of industries. Right. Are there any industries where you don't do valuation or appraisal work? Well, one of the reasons I went into chemical engineering is because I hated IT and, and electrical <laughs> type things. So um, we don't do any work in uh, for IT equipment or software development, um, things like that. Um, you know, if it's manufacturing, then you know we're going to be tough to beat in terms of a knowledge base and, and our ability to perform the appraisals, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as as needed. Um, service businesses we do as well, but again, more. Um, uh, in the areas of uh, providing like personal services like medical, we do a lot of medical work, we do a lot of uh, uh, medical practices, uh, law practices, um, accounting firms, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Something more esoteric relating or closer to IT and, and what's called technology today, we probably want to refer out to somebody else. So th there's some aspect of the technology in IT companies, software or whatever it might be, that is different from evaluation or appraisal standpoint than the technology, the patents or whatever there might be in a pharmaceutical business. They're definitely, yeah, yeah, they're, ahead, they're definitely different. Um, and also we wouldn't have the understanding. So if someone tells me that well, I, I developed this software and it's, you know, it took, it's 200,000 lines of code or 2 million lines of code, that doesn't mean anything to me. I, you know, I don't know if that's a lot or a little, or you know, is is that really something special or not? I don't know. Um, on the other hand, you tell me about an R and D project that you've you've developed a new compound, a new drug, a new chemical. I can I can understand that. I can relate to that, and then from there I can I can you know ask more questions that can get me to a better endpoint in terms of the valuation. So. I think it's it's uh, it's better for the clients, and we have no problem at all if someone comes to us with a with a with a, in an area that we we don't believe we can provide our top performance for. Uh, we certainly know other people who can, and we'd be happy to refer that over to those people. Okay, Frank. When I think about um, some of the reasons, and we've covered some of the reasons why people would need evaluation specialist, uh, business partnerships forming, mm -hmm. business partnerships uh, dissolving, uh, marriages dissolving, um, I mean, variety of different right. reasons. How, how would I go about choosing which, which business valuation uh, expert is right for me? Okay. Well, the, f the, the business valuation expert should be qualified. Um, and the IRS has a very broad definition of that, uh, which uh, ultimately, if you're taking the task, you're going to have to prove that you are qualified. And by qualified, that uh, means that you've got a very good familiarity with the subject matter. And it's not only the fact that you have a very good similarity, a very good familiarity with the technology of business valuations, but you should also have a good familiarity with the technology of the subject business that you're valuing. Uh, the IRS would also require, as an aside, that this is what you do for a living. You know, I'm a business valuator. So, if you're a uh, if you're an accountant and you do 400 um, tax returns a year and two business valuations, even though you may have the same certifications that I do, you're not necessarily qualified, and that could get you that could get you thrown out, and your you know your your report could be in jeopardy because of that. So. First thing is to be sure that the person is qualified and they understand and that you can talk to them. You have to be able to work with them. Um, for, for us, you know, working with in, in the high-tech high tech areas such as pharmaceuticals or, or specialty chemicals and things like that, you know, we can talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. you know, no one's going to put words out at us that we, we don't understand because, because we're, we have the background. Uh, and you want to be able to do that because if you've got to water down your story to the appraiser in order for him to understand what you're doing, well, you may not give the, the full story the right story. And then it's a matter of challenging. Um, many appraisers will simply say, well, management told me that you know, this technology is greatest thing since sliced bread and it's going to take over the market and you know, we're going to have 100 million in sales in five years. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can't challenge that, you've got to accept it. And if the, if the Premises, the premise is false or, or just not realistic, 
you know, that the uh, business owner, of course, are always, you know, uh, hockey sticking their, their sales, um, you're going to end up with a valuation that's, that's just no one's going to believe. And, and if it's not defensible, it's not a good valuation. So choosing the person that you can work with, uh, that understands your business, is qualified, I mean, those are the most important steps. It seems like low-hanging fruit in your business would be the large accounting firms. How do you all differ to the large accounting firms? Well, the large accounting firms, you know, can do it all. You know, and there's uh, there's a lot of small accounting firms or mid-sized accounting firms, certainly around Philadelphia, that are trying to uh, align with different kinds of companies, so they can also do it all. Um, we're very different than the accounting firms in that first, you know, we don't have CPAs on staff. We have engineers on staff. Second, um, we have people with lots of hands-on experience. Frequently in the accounting firms, uh, you'll see, obviously there'll be some people that have industry experience, but more often than not, they started their career, or they finished graduate school and started their career with Deloitte or PwC or wherever it happened to be, and they never were, never put a helmet on and walked mm -hmm. into a plant. Uh, never touched and felt the chemicals or saw how they were made. Uh, experienced, you know, the ups and downs and, and things that you're not going to find in the textbooks and in the, uh, in the, you know, the manuals on how to do business valuation. You're not going to find that until you've lived it. So, I think we think that's um, that's what separates us from the rest of the guys. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we also don't have people charging five to seven hundred dollars an hour, um, you know, for services. Uh, who are perhaps overlooking what might be a hundred or hundred and fifty dollar an hour junior person? So, I mean, ultimately you're paying even more, you know, for that. So, uh, f hiring EAC valuations, you're going to get people that understand your business and they're experienced and, and can do the job. In increasingly, intellectual property and intangible assets are more and more, you know, the value. Mm -hmm. of a business, or at least among the most valuable assets that a business might have. Right. How do you go about, you know, valuing intangible assets or intellectual property like that? It's a very good question. Um, there are many ways uh, to do that. Um, one of the, the basic premise in most valuation is, is substitution. What is, the, the, the asset is worth what it would cost me to get it elsewhere. Okay, from a third party. I mean, that, that's very basic, uh, very basic premise of all valuation. Mm -hmm. So for intangible assets, you have to um, apply cash flows, future cash flows, which of course are suspect. Every, every, no one can predict what the cash flows are going to be. But typically what we use for, say, patents, trademarks, technology, is what's called a relief from royalty method. And what that means is, what would I have to pay a third party to license this mm -hmm. technology that I have from them? If, if I didn't have it, I needed to run my business, what would I pay them? And that's, what, that's the methodology we use. Now, the, the royalties, there's, there's databases, there's companies. In fact, there's one right across the, right across the river, AUS Consultants in uh, Cherry Hill, that collects licenses, license agreements and has all that data. So if I have a, um, a pharmaceutical product, a pharmaceutical patent, for example, and I want to know what, to, what kind of royalty would be payable, I can go to their database and pull up a range of numbers and all the terms, in some cases the contracts themselves, that I say a company signed that licensed the patent from Big Pharma or, or the other way around, Big Pharma licensed from, from a small guy. Mm -hmm. Uh, from there, you need to uh, apply a, a royalty rate that's reasonable. Right. Okay. Uh, they may say, for example, that 10% of sales is is a royalty that you would pay. Well, that's fine if the gross margins or the operating margins of of the of the product are, say, 20 to 60 percent. Let me let me stop you and just I, I want to try to turn the focus of this a little bit okay. and maybe bring it back to like a real world thing for our viewers. Right. Can you, without naming names, can you think of a, um, a, a situation where you had a, a particularly challenging, you know, intellectual property or intangible asset that you were valuing and can you sort of describe 
what the challenge was and how you had to go about it. We we're, we're running late on time, but okay, I wanted sorry. to give you an opportunity to talk about that. All right, thank you, appreciate that. Well, we were approached uh, two or three years ago by a company, startup, a pharmaceutical startup, that had uh, received the rights to an orphan drug. And as you know, an orphan drug is right. pharma has put it on the shelf and don't know what the, they don't they don't want to play there anymore in that part of the body or whatever it happens to be. Well, they acquired the rights to it and they came to us to ask what would this be worth on a commercial um, basis. We're looking for someone to co-fund with us to help us through the phase two, phase three, phase four approval process and then ultimately commercialize the product. And we don't have enough money to do that so we would like to take what we've developed, uh, come up with a value and then present that value to Big Pharma. It would have to be Big Pharma in this, in this particular case. So some big numbers. And what is, it, what is it worth? What would the business be worth? So we would then be able to discuss with, those, with the Big Pharma uh, licensing fees or investments or whatever they needed in order to get the product through the process. So they came to us with uh, some pretty detailed projections uh, for different products uh, with different um, uh, applications, uh, different parts of the world. I mean, they, they, re they had really done their homework. They had spent a lot of time developing the financials for this. But still the question was, what is it worth? You know, this, these projections are great. They weren't hockey stick-like. They, were, they looked reasonable. Uh, the, the drugs that they were talking about. I just want to stop you for one second. We have about 60 seconds, and I don't think it's going to oh, allow okay. you to do justice to this story, and I feel terrible about it. I'm sorry. Because I think yeah. we could go for another what? 15 or 20 minutes. But if, if you could try to summarize without giving as, as much detail sure. in about 60 seconds, okay. that would be great. All right. What we ended up doing in this particular case was we ended up developing a, a modified Monte Carlo simulation where we created probabilities, and we used the variable that, that determined the... Um, uh, the value of the of the assets as time. The patents were going to expire on a certain date. Every time they ran into a roadblock in, in approval process, it delayed them. It slowed them down such to the point where their commercialization time was shrinking. So the value was actually based on the commercial time that was left mm -hmm. after they went through the process. If they were everything went great, maybe they would go through the process in three years and they'd have ten plus years of commercialization. If things went wrong then they may have less than 10 or five years, and then the overall value would correspondingly be less. So I think uh, you know, it, was a, it was a unique way of, uh, of applying the principles of valuation and, and, and modeling. Mm -hmm. And we came to what, came, what I think was a very good number, and uh, I, I'm not sure if they used a, it or not. A unique way to <laughs> arrive it's, at it. But, yeah. but it's a unique way of arriving at you know, using time. There's nobody right. that, has, that we've so, seen that's so used So you're, you're able to be very creative under Difficult circumstances, which is that's a, correct, and we're not because we're not uh, we're not bound by you know previous training of uh, you know you must do it this way. Right. You know, that's so. great. Well, I, I'm sorry I couldn't let you. It was very interesting, and I'm sorry I couldn't let you go further. But we're we're up against it time wise. Okay. So um, I, I want to thank our special guest Frank Miranda uh, for being here with us this evening, and Charlie, thank you for co-hosting. Pleasure. Um, the next guest on the show is Tony Parisi, who's the CFO of Dynamic Solar. So please uh, tune into the next uh, episode and watch Tony. Uh, also, I want to remind our viewers that Money Matters is now available as an audio podcast on iTunes and Stitcher Radio, listed as Money Matters, the podcast for mobile devices. And the video is also available on our YouTube channel, as well as on our website. Thank you all for watching this evening, and we'll see you again next time.